أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر اللهم اجعلنا من الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر أمين يا رب العالمين الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين Inshallah ta'ala, we are starting our final session on Surah Al-Asr. Uh, this has been a series that's been going on at the Irving Islamic Center for the past three weeks. And we've been trying to wrap up some lessons from Surah Al-Asr since then, but hopefully we can get to the conclusion of it, bi'idhnillah, uh, today. Uh, what we've already covered are the first two ayat in a lot of detail, and we are going to spend a good amount of time discussing the final ayah and the relationship between the four uh, pieces of that final ayah. Even in regards to the last ayah, a lot of commentary was already offered in the last session. But we'll just go and uh, do a basic overview, inshallah ta'ala, and wrap things up. The first things first. In the world we live in, and as we live, uh, we all already mentioned that the four conditions of success that Allah mentions in Surah Al-Asr are not associated with success in the world around us. In other words, if you ask any person, an average even Muslim or non, when you ask them what it means to be successful, the things that don't come in their mind are iman, or righteous deeds, or in, you know, enjoining truth and enjoining patience and pursuit. These are not the things that come in their mind. Career, education, wealth, you know, establishment, family, these are the kinds of things that come in people's minds when they think about success. So the first thing that the surah is demanding from us as far as our, uh, as far as our change in attitude is really it demands from us to think about success and failure in a way that most people don't. And this sets us apart from everybody else. Then, when you do experience this change in thought, then before this change, the things that seemed unimportant or irrelevant or minuscule become very heavy. And the things that used to be really, really important become less and less and less important. You're the, you know, the way you prioritize things, it changes because of the attitude demanded in these last four uh, conditions to salvation. Now as far as the first condition is concerned, a lot of, and we're just talking about just a common observation, I'm not going to use much academic terminology today because we're done with that part of the surah study before. A lot of people don't associate iman with anything other than just a statement. They just say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah, I'm done, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Maybe a little bit of, or we just go to the masjid sometimes, pray some, not even regular prayer, maybe Jamara, right? Uh, but they, be, the, the idea, why do Muslims behave in this way, the vast majority of them? Obviously you could claim it, it as a lack of knowledge, but really what it is, is an attitude. And the attitude is, I'm already saved because I have Iman. Iman is the only condition. Now there are two problems with that attitude. The first problem is the assumption that we have Iman. The second problem is the assumption that iman alone is enough. So the, the two problems with that. So let's address the first problem. To assume that we have iman, we first have to understand what does it mean to have iman, and what it means to you know what iman means is two things. You could think of it from a legal point of view, and you could think of it from a real you know a reality point of view. From a legal point of view, anyone who says la ilaha illallah, anyone who says Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam has what? They have iman. When Allah says, Ya ayyuha ladina amanu, those of you who believe, who's He talking to? Anyone who says the shahada. Everyone who, he, who says the shahada is included in that address. When you look at someone and they say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh, if they say salam to you, what's your automatic assumption about them? They have iman. They've met that baseline condition. So this, is, this however is from a worldly legal point of view. Legally speaking, anyone who claims to be Muslim is Muslim. And they have, you know, for us then in that sense, Islam is no different than Iman. They're essentially the same thing. Faith and Islam are the same. But then there's the matter of that distinction that Allah Himself makes in Surah Al-Hujurat. Where He says, قَالَتِ الْأَعْرَابُ آمَنَّا قُلْ لَمْ تُؤْمِنُوا وَلَكِنْ قُولُوا أَسْلَمْنَا The Bedouins say we have Iman. Tell them no, you, uh, you only have Islam. 
You've only accepted Islam. And Iman, وَلَمَّا يَدْخُلِ iman fi قُلُوبِكُمْ Iman hasn't entered your hearts yet. In other words, in this statement we learned that what people assume to be Iman happens to be what? According to Allah. Islam. That's just Islam. And where does Iman rest? Iman doesn't rest on the tongue. According to this ayah, where does Iman rest? In the heart. So now it's a change of thought. You know, The one who assumes that they have Iman based on what they said with their tongue, is already being given a change of attitude. They're being told, no, 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 iman is something else, it's in the heart. Now there, there are many things that are talked about in the Qur'an in regards to the heart, but at least three things that I'd like to share with you in regards to this discussion, that I think are paramount. At least three things I'm gonna highlight. Because you know the terminology of Surah Al-Asr is very simple. But at the same time it's very complex. Because when you say iman, well, two-thirds of the Qur'an is talking about iman. Right? So when you say, إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا And you want to explore in the Qur'an, what does it mean, those who believe, that you're really engaged in pretty much the entire Qur'an study? Right? It's a complex thing. So we have to pick and choose at least some things to give this discussion some structure. What does it mean to have iman in the heart? Well, what I'm going to reduce this discussion to is there are three things that Allah mentions predominantly that rest inside the heart. There are three things inside the heart. The first thing we just mentioned, what is it? Iman. Right? وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ حَبَّبَ إِلَيْكُمُ الْإِيمَانِ وَزَيَّنَهُ فِي قُلُوبِكُمْ So that's the first thing inside the heart. The second thing we find is revelation. The Messenger ﷺ was told, نَزَلَ بِهِ الرُّوحُ الْأَمِينَ عَلَىٰ قَلْبِكَ The angel Jibreel, he, sent it, he, he brought it down on your heart. Revelation came on to the heart of the Messenger ﷺ. When Allah talks about the people of knowledge, He says, بَلْ هُوَ آيَاتٌ بَيِّنَاتٌ فِي صُدُورِ الَّذِينَ أُوتُ الْعِلْمِ in, in Surah Al-Ankabut. These are miraculous signs in the chests of those who have been given knowledge. In other words, the second thing inside the heart, the first thing is iman, the second is revelation. Revelation. When we memorize Qur'an, when we, when, we, when we internalize the reminder of Qur'an, if we really internalize it, it's not on your tongue and it's not in your head. Where is it? It's in your heart. فِي صُدُورِ الَّذِينَ أُوتُ الْعِلْمِ In the chests of those who've truly been given knowledge. And it's interesting that Allah put knowledge there, because usually we associate knowledge with our mind, not with our chest, not with our heart, right? So He combined those two concepts together. So the first thing was iman, the second thing was the ayat, the revelation. The third thing in, that's mentioned associated over and over again, among others, there are other things, but the thing that's associated most with the heart is actually dhikr, remembrance. Remembrance and reminder. That's associated constantly, constantly with the heart. So Allah Azza wa Jalla says, وَلَا تُطِعْ مَنْ أَغْفَلْنَا قَلْبَهُ عَنْ ذِكْرِنَا Don't follow the one whose heart is void of our remembrance. So what's missing from the heart? Remembrance. He says, أَلَا بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ تَطْمَئِنَّ الْقُلُوبِ Know that by the remembrance of Allah, hearts become tranquil. So the third thing associated with the heart is remembrance. By the way, the, the climax of iman, when you have, your heart is full of iman, you know what the word for that is? That word, the word is sakina. When your heart is completely filled with iman, then the gift of that iman, which we talked about last time, the fruit of that iman is sakina, which is what Allah talks about in Surah Al-Fatih. In Surah Al-Fatih, He mentions that Allah sent sakina on the believers into their hearts. Okay. So this, but that's a separate topic. So the three core things that I wanted to mention in regards to the heart were iman itself, then the ayat, and then the third, dhikr, remembrance. I, re- I mentioned these three things because all of these three things are actually part and parcel of the same thing. In other words, when you have ayat in your heart, what does that increase? Your iman. When you remember Allah, what's the best way to remember Allah? The ayat of Allah. And when you remember the, Him through the ayat, then iman increases. And how do I know these three things are connected? Let's turn to Surah Al-Anfal for a moment. This is the eighth surah of the Qur'an. إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا ذُكِرَ اللَّهِ وَجِلَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ the true believers are those when Allah is mentioned or remembered, their hearts tremble. When Allah is mentioned or remembered, their hearts tremble. So what is now mentioned next to the heart? Remembrance. Look at Allah, wajilat kulubum. We're in the same ayah now, I'll go on. وَإِذَا تُلِيَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتُهُ When his ayat are recited unto them. Now what's, what else is in this ayah? The ayat. There's remembrance and there's ayat. What's the only thing left? There were three things, right? There's the remembrance, there's the ayat, what was the third thing? Iman. Zadathum imanan wa ala rabbihim yatawakkalun. These ayat 
increase them in terms of iman and they continue to place their trust in their master exclusively right so the three things are put together by Allah azza wa jal now when so so in other words the first change of attitude how do i know if i even have iman do i have these three things and how do i know if i'm really counted among those who believe when allah is mentioned what happens to my heart when the ayat are mentioned does my iman increase do i feel something and especially the easiest gauge of that is the salah. Because Allah says to Musa alayhi salam, aqim is salat ali dhikri. Establish salah to remember me. The easiest gauge of iman is salah. And you know how connected salah and iman are. This will come up again later on today. But you know how connected salah and iman are? Allah azza wa jal says in, in Surah Al Baqarah, in terms of not wasting the deeds of the believers, Allah azza wa jal mentions in the Quran, wa ma kan Allahu liyubi'a imanakum. Allah would not be one to waste your iman. You know when the qibla was changed? When the qibla was changed, certain Bani Israel said, you've been praying in, this, in the wrong direction. None of that counted. None of that counted. And Allah responded, Allah would never be one to waste your prayer. But instead of using the word prayer, salah, what did He use? Iman in the meaning of prayer. He used it interchangeably. In other words, a sign of iman is what? Salah. And Salat combines those three things. It's a sign of Iman, it, is, it comprises the ayat of Allah, and it is the ultimate form of dhikr. Aqimis Salat ali dhikri. Subhanallah. How incredibly these things are interconnected with each other. This is a personal gauge for someone if they have Iman or not. Yet last time I mentioned some fruits of Iman, I'll, I'll complete that discussion today inshallah ta'ala. But before I do, the second fallacy. The first fallacy was the assumption if we have Iman or not. And if you don't want to check with anything else, just what you feel on the inside. These three things that we just mentioned. The third, the second problem, the second uh, common misconception is that iman has nothing. To, once you have iman, you don't need action. You don't need any more deeds. They're two, two separate things. It's like an extra thing you're doing. You don't have to do it, and even without it, you can still have iman. They're they're separable. But actually, what we're learning in this surah and many, many, many places in the Quran is that these two things are inseparable. You you really can't separate iman from action. From a logical point of view, we're not even, I'm not even going to give you a religious explanation. From a fairly, fairly simple, you know, uh, a logical point of view, if you really believe fire burns, if you really believe it burns, would you touch it? No. If you're convinced it's going to harm you, it will affect your behavior. If you really believe that going to your job is important, you believe that, you're convinced of that, you're going to go on time. If you don't think it's that important, you might slack off. So it entirely depends on what your action is now determined by what? You believe. That's a very simple thing to understand. So to disconnect these two things and say, yeah, I don't pray, but I still have iman. Or I don't, yeah, I don't concern myself too much about halal and haram. Or I don't concern myself too much with the commandments of Allah Azza wa Jal. But I still have iman. That's a fallacy. These two things are necessarily intertwined and connected. They're connected. And actually, Allah Azza wa Jal, sometimes He talks to the believers and He says, what kind of iman is this? What kind of iman do you people have? He says, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, lima taquluna ma la taf'alun. Those of you who have iman, why do you say what you don't do? The criticism in that ayah, you have iman, but what's not there? Action. How, what kind of iman is this that you don't have action? Similarly, he says, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, ma lakum? إِذَا قِيلَ لَكُمْ مُنْفِرُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ ثَقَلْتُ مِلَ الْأَرْضِ In Surah Al-Tawbah, he says, those of you who have iman, what's wrong with you? Whenever you're told, come forward in Allah's path, your feet get planted into the earth, you don't move forward. In other words, Allah is calling you to action by challenging whether or not you have iman. They're connected together. They're inseparable. So this, this change of attitude, before you think about anybody else, you and I have to experience this change of attitude. It's one thing to talk about this relationship in theory and to study it, and to talk about the different scholars who gave evidences, uh, academic evidences for the relationship between iman and amal. But it's another to internalize that and say, my iman will not survive if I don't have actions. Now, the proof, one of the proofs of iman is inside, whether you feel it or not. What's the other proof of iman now? Actions. So, you know, iman is proven now for yourself. Do your, does your action reflect iman or no? That becomes a good formula for yourself and myself, whether or not we manif the iman inside our hearts is manifest. By the way, in that same ayah where Allah told them, you don't have iman, you only have what? You only have Islam. 
Then he gave them hope. You want to get iman? وَإِن تُطِيعُ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ لَا يَلِتْكُمْ مِنْ أَعْمَالِكُمْ شَيْئًا If you continue to obey Allah and His Messenger, none of your deeds will be cancelled away. In other words, a'mal are mentioned. Right after he said, he said, you don't quite have iman. But instead of saying, how do you get iman? What did he mention? <laughs> Actions. In other words, he's giving them a clue. You want to get iman? Continue to obey Allah and His Messenger and you will develop Iman. It will go from Islam all the way to Iman. May Allah grant all of us real Iman. The, the, the final just side comment on the study of Qur'an and in regards to Iman, it's a beautiful topic. It's a study like that could take years in and of itself. Just the study of Iman in the Qur'an. But just one comment we'll make about that. Is the difference between two very common terms in the Qur'an that most Muslims don't pay much attention to. There's, Ya أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا You know that phrase, right? Ya أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا Also, الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا Those who believe. But then there's the phrase al-mu'minun or al-mu'minin, believers. So in English I'm saying those who believe, and then I'm saying what's the other phrase? Believers. What's the difference between these two things? First of all, note, one of them is verbal. It, there's a verb involved. Those who believe, now believe is a verb. Amanu is a fa'l al-madi. Okay, it's silatul mausul for al It's a verb. Okay. When I say al-mu'minuna, believers, that is not a verb, that is a noun. Now rhetorically in Arabic, the difference between a noun and a verb is a verb is temporary, it's not stable, but a, but a noun is permanent, fixed. When Allah says, الَّذِينَ amanu, These are people whose iman may go up or down, and they may be weak iman, they may have weak iman, but they may even only have Islam. They may not even have too much iman yet, but the larger category, broad statement is being made in a legal sense. But when Allah uses al mu'minun. Guess who he's referring to? The people of mature iman. Which is why you find, whenever you find in the Qur'an the phrase al-mu'minun, you will never find criticism of those people. You'll find elevated praise of those people that are called al-mu'minun. But when you find the phrase al-ladhina amanu, you may or may not find nice things. <coughs> you may find Allah saying to them, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, aminu. Those of you who believe, believe. In other words, how that's been understood is, Become true believers. Become real believers. And by the way, those who believe, الَّذِينَ amanu, Not necessarily doing well. Because Allah says, why do you say what you don't do? Right? Not necessarily. But الْمُؤْمِنُونَ What does He say about them? قَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ Not الَّذِينَ amanu, But الْمُؤْمِنُونَ Those who've attained that mature iman, which necessarily leads to action, those people have already attained success. They are already, Qad means already. They've already been successful. And notice, when Allah mentioned Al-Mu'minun, the entire passage deals with actions. الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ خَاشِعُونَ وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ عَنِ اللَّهُ بِمُحَادِدُونَ Actions, actions. And start with, starts with Iman. And all these actions are mentioned. So you see that these two things become inseparable. May Allah Azza wa Jal include us among the Mu'mineen. Now, the, the next thing we're going to talk about is inshallah ta'ala, the, 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 core, the core facets of Iman. The, the three core pillars of Iman. I, first I'd like to give a disclaimer. This is not a study of Aqidah. Aqidah is a technical study. It's a study of theology. It's a study of you know, how we interpret certain things in the sacred text in regards to, to metaphysics, the afterlife, the attributes of Allah Azza wa And it can even become sometimes a very philosophical kind of study. And a very technical and dry study. This is not a study of Aqidah. This is a study of Iman. We should keep these two things distinct. Though they have a relationship with each other, there's a fundamental difference. Aqidah is an intellectual study. And Iman rests where? In the heart. So that's one fundamental difference between the two of them. Okay? But as far as Iman is concerned, in simple terms, you can even explain this to a child this way. You can say that Iman is basically, it, it's, it comprises three fundamental pillars, or three fundamental facets. The first of them is Iman in Allah. The second of them is Iman in a message. And the third of them is iman in an afterlife. Okay, so it's, in Arabic we say at tawheed wal risala wal akhirah. So it's iman in Allah, at tawheed, iman in a message. By the way, when I, when we say message, it includes the book and it includes the messenger. Because only when the two of them come, to, come together, then you have a clear message. You know where we learned that in Surah Al-Bayyinah. If you missed the tafsir of that, when Allah says hatta taatiyahumul. Bayina, the perfect, the, the complete proof came to them. What's the explanation of Allah? What bayina is? Rasulun min Allahi yatlu suhufa mutahara. Bayina, the perfect proof 
that came from Allah, the message that came from Allah is a messenger from Allah who recites purified scripture. So the, 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 the messenger and the message have been combined. Together this is Risala. And then the third part is Akhirah. The, thing, the reason I brought these three pillars up for you, I mean you could say there are other aspects of Iman, other dimensions of Iman. These are the three core pillars. The reason I bring these three core pillars up to your attention is, sometimes people take one of these, or two of these, or, you know, and, and they say their Iman is complete. And if you only highlight one of them at the expense of the other two, you will end up falling into corruption. And you will actually end up in a serious psychological imbalance also. There are people who believe in God. You may have met co-workers who say, I have faith in God too. I love God. God is great. He's awesome. He's so merciful. I believe He created too. What do they refuse to accept though? They say, I don't think there's an afterlife. I love God, but I don't think there's an afterlife. And I don't believe that God talks to a human being or sends any angels. I don't believe in that stuff. So they've accepted Iman in Allah, but what not? Iman in the message or Iman in the afterlife. They, those two are gone. Now what's the problem with that? You see that the, 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 the fundamental problem with that is, now what does Allah want from you? What does Allah, how do you know what Allah wants from you? Okay, there's a God. Up in the heavens, he's, we don't know, you know anything, we can't see Him. We see His power manifest, but we don't know what He wants from us. Am I, am I, was I created for a purpose? If I was, I guess since He created me, He should be the one telling me my purpose. But since I don't believe in any message, I don't believe in any messenger that he sends, I guess I will decide for myself what my purpose is. So even though you have Iman in Allah, you have no regard for what he wants from you because now who's, dictate, who's in charge of, of you? Yourself. Yourself. Then there are people who highlight the belief in the message, right, the message, and they ignore the Akhirah, or they ignore Tawheed. And, and each of these is a discussion in and of themselves. But the, one, the, the point I wanted to highlight is, these three core concepts of Iman are the subject of Makki Qur'an. The Makkan Qur'an revolves around these three things. Establishing belief in Allah, establishing belief in the message, and establishing belief in the Akhirah. These are the three core things. When these three things become strong and solid, then what happens? Now you have Iman. Just one slight thing that is of importance to common Muslims, that should just kind of get mentioned in passing. Though when we get to those surahs in Qur'an, it will come in more detail. Iman and Risala. A lot of times when people talk about Iman, faith, even faith. What comes to mind? Faith in God. But when you, when you mention the word faith or Iman even, you know who doesn't come to mind? The Messenger. Faith in the Messenger. You know we say, آمَنْتُ بِاللَّهِ وَمَلَائِكَتِهِ وَكُتُبِهِ وَرُسُلِهِ right? We don't think of the Messengers when we... The first thing that we associate with faith is Allah. And so a lot of the times the discussion about Aqidah becomes a discussion about who? Allah. But a, you know, a pillar of our faith is also Iman in the Messenger. Why am I highlighting this? Sometimes you might say things about Rasulullah wasallam that will negate your Iman. You know the same way you say something about Allah that you shouldn't say, and that can waste your Iman away? It's blasphemous. We should also know what we shouldn't be saying about the Messenger You know how sometimes we might end up believing something about Allah that is inappropriate? We shouldn't believe that about Allah? We might have the wrong belief in regards to Allah. That will ruin our Iman. The same thing can happen if we have corrupted beliefs about who? The Messenger wasallam. This is very important. And the example of that that I wanted to highlight before you are the two extremes in the Ummah today. I will not name any names. On the one extreme you have people that love Rasulullah wasallam so much, so much that they say and believe things about him that actually end up contradicting what he himself taught. They end up doing that. Out of what? Love. On the other end you have pseudo-intellectuals who talk about Muslims, claiming to be Muslims, who talk about the Messenger of Allah wasallam as though they're talking about any historical figure, with no regard. So on the one hand you have people that have way too much regard, and it's good, but it, and it turns into something bad. Because their iman starts getting corrupted. They start giving him a status beyond a human being and all kinds of crazy things like that. And on the other hand, you have this extreme where you don't give him any regard. You don't even say sallallahu alayhi wa when his name is mentioned. Or when somebody says this is a hadith narrated by so and so and it's sahih. Oh, it's just a hadith. You know, it's just, it's, come on, that's just sunnah. It's not even in the Quran. When you talk like that about the Messenger alayhi 
this is also, this is maybe something that takes your iman away altogether. Just to give you a, 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 some clue of what I'm talking about here, as far as iman, within the messenger. Even though that's again a separate topic, this is a topic of three core surahs of the Qur'an by the way. Iman in the messenger, if you want to learn it on your own. Surah al right? Then Surah Al-Fatih, before it, and Muhammad, three surahs. So Muhammad, Fatih, Hujurat are the surahs of the study of iman in the... Messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. What does it mean to have iman in the messenger? But just one basic concept. You know how you, we, you and I call each other. We, you and I call. Hey, how's it going? Hey, imam. Hey, sheikh. Hey, teacher. Hey, brother Noman. Hey, you. One time, these people they came to the messenger's quarters, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. They said, "Ya Muhammad, ukhruj alayna. Muhammad, we gotta come talk to you. Come out. We gotta talk to you." These were Bedouins. They were kind of ghetto. They didn't have good manners. They were raised in a, in a certain way. So they figured, they're Muslims though, they're Muslims. But they, they called him by what? They called him by his name. Now listen, in the Quran, Allah says, Ya Adam, uskun anta wa zawjuka al jannah. Ya Isa, inni mutawafika wa rafiruka ilayhi. Ya Zakariya, inna nubashiruka bi ghulam. Ya Dawood, inna ja'annaka khalifatan fil ard. What are we learning? Ya and the name of a messenger. But you know what we don't find in the Quran? We don't find Ya Muhammad. There is no Ya Ahmad. There's no, Ya Rasulullah, Ya Ayyuhal Nabi, Ya Ayyuhal Muzzammil, Ya Ayyuhal Muddathir. SubhanAllah. The way Allah talks to His Messenger, He doesn't even call him by his name. So much respect. And even when He mentions his name, He says Rasulullah next to it. Muhammadun Rasulullah wa alladhina ma'ahu. Ma kana Muhammadun aba ahadim min rijalikum, walakin Rasulullah. Right? Wa mubashiran bi rasulin ya'ti min ba'di ismuhu Ahmad. SubhanAllah. Over and over and over again. Now, the, the thing I wanted to highlight, these guys came out and said, Ya Muhammad al what did Allah say? By the way, did they insult him? Did they use bad language against him? Did they say something inappropriate? No, they called him by what? His name. His name. Allah says, وَلَا تَجْهَرُوا لَهُ بِالْقَوْلِ كَجَهْرِ بَعْضِكُمْ بَعْدًا أَن تَحْبَطَ أَعْمَالُكُمْ وَأَنْتُمْ لَا تَشْعُرُونَ Don't you call him like you call each other, making your voices loud, because all of your deeds may be seized, and you won't even know. When does someone's deeds don't count? When, does, when, does, when are someone's deeds useless? When they don't have iman. When you don't have iman, none of your deeds count. If you have iman, then your good deeds count. You know, there are people who do good deeds without what? Without iman. And Allah says about them, they will bring their good deeds. وَقَدِرْنَا إِلَى مَا عَمِلُوا مِنْ عَمَلٍ They will bring their good deeds forward, will turn it into scattered dust. فَجَعَلْنَاهُ هَبَاءً مَنْفُورًا in this ayah, what, which, which iman did they violate? The iman with the Messenger of Allah Wasallam. This is a critical part of iman. So when I say iman, in, when we read iman in this ayah, we should know this. Now I'm going to quickly run through because of the shortage of time, and I really want to finish with the last word today, uh, inshaAllah, uh, are the fruits of iman. Number one, the, the, the greatest fruit of iman is tranquility, peace of mind. No one will enjoy peace of mind like the one who has real iman. So if you don't enjoy tranquility in your life, guess what's missing? Iman is missing. This is the first fruit of Iman. Because, what does this tranquility come from? You, you come to terms with the fact that no injustice will go unanswered, no suffering goes unnoticed, no deed goes unrewarded, no affliction except it comes as a test, and then it becomes a means of forgiveness. With every difficulty, you have Iman that there's going to be what? إِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرَى This puts you at ease.